It is my absolute pleasure to invite our pastor to bring the message this morning. I know that it is going to be heartwarming, consciousness expanding, and very inspiring. And you can be guaranteed that he will bring you an assignment to enable each and every one of us to grow and expand and to continue to be truly able to embrace this wonderful thing called truth. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and help me welcome our pastor, Reverend John Scott. Thank you, Sandy, for that wonderful introduction and good morning, worldwide spiritual family. To our first Sunday in June, my goodness, where is the year going? Wherever it is, we're going with it and we are ready. Are we ready? Yes. So it's my joy to welcome you to the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living in beautiful Jamaica. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being part of this. I want to call it a movement. This it's not a religion. It's a worldwide movement to take the truth of God's omnipresence and God's grace and God's beauty and God's love across this globe so that there is, there is not a place, not a home, not a village, not a township where God is not recognized, worshipped in many, many different forms, but ever one God. It is a joy for me to be with you this morning and to share this encouragement. Thank you for being hair in consciousness in all, with all your love and all your beauty. And so a little child um, is tearfully objecting to being put to bed in a dark room by her mom. And the mother is trying to soothe her, she, the mother is a science of man student, by assuring her that she's never ever alone because wherever she is, God is. The little kid cries, yes, I know, but I want someone with skin on. We might laugh at that, I know, but many of us are right where that little girl is, aren't we? In consciousness. We have a deep desire to clothe God in human form. The problem is that many of us still have vestiges of that old conditioning that caused us to think of God as he was portrayed in the Old Testament. In pre-Mosaic Israel, God was con conceived of as being attached to places, to altars, to trees, to pillars, to wells, and other natural objects. And then Moses popularized the ark, which was supposed to house God. They carried God around in the ark and they were convinced that if the ark was ever captured in battle, they would certainly lose the battle. Eventually, the ark came to be housed in the temple and it became known as the house of the Lord. And today, the idea still persists and many people go to churches, temples, and synagogues because this is the way they think they they have to use to get close to God. So God is thought of as something external and remote and separate from human life. And you know, I still hear preachers on television and radio teaching the Old Testament concept of a God of the skies, a jealous anthropomorphic being full of vengeance and wrath. And jealous, he's referred to as a jealous God. It is really interesting to me to contrast the God of the Old Testament with the concept of God revealed by Jesus the way sure. Listen to this from Numbers 15, verse 32. Quote, And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day, and they that found him gathering sticks 
brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation. And listen to this. And the Lord said unto Moses, The man shall surely be put to death. And all the congregation brought him without the camp and stoned him with stones. And he died as the Lord had commanded Moses. End of quote. Contrast this with an event 1,500 years later, as recorded in Mark chapter 2, verses 22 to 25 or 26, I think. Quote, And it came to pass that he went through the, the cornfields on the Sabbath day, and his disciples began as they went to pluck the ears of corn. And the Pharisees said unto him, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath that which is not lawful? And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. End of that scripture. Again, I want you to compare the prayer of David. And remember, David was known as the man after God's own heart. Listen to David asking vengeance upon his enemies in Psalm 109. Let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. Let his children be vagabonds and beg. Let there be none to extend kindness unto him. Neither let there be one, be anyone to have pity on his fatherless children. End of David's plea to God. Remember, that's a wrathful God, created in the image and likeness of a wrathful people. And now listen to Jesus, the way sure, the Christ did, the anointed one, in Matthew 5, 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. End of that scripture. What a difference between the Old Testament approach and the New Testament approach. One of wrath and war and one of love and peace and reconciliation. So you can really see why there was a little boy after having many weeks of Sunday school devoted to the Old Testament and then coming to the first lesson in the New Testament and after Sunday school he said to his friend, boy, God sure got better as he got older, didn't he? <laughs> Indeed, man's understanding of the infinite has evolved over the centuries, thank God. This is understandable. After all, from a scientific standpoint, we have a far better knowledge of the earth than people of the Old Testament times. Genesis reveals an earth that is the center of the universe with sun and stars hung in a sky and the firmament overarching the earth and God somewhere above that canopy. We have come a long way, my friends, haven't we, in science? And Jesus' concept of God this was certainly a long way from the concept of Moses' day. In his conversation with the woman at the well of Samaria, the master teacher and way shower said, and I quote, God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him how? In spirit and in truth. Now, you know, the Latin word spiritus, from which we get the word spirit, comes from a root which means to breathe, to blow, to live. Spiritus, to breathe, to blow, to live. Spirit then is the life principle, the divine breath which God is breathing in you and throughout the universe. The word spirit therefore implies unformed, unspecialized, unrestricted limitlessness. So you can see that when Jesus said God is spirit, he was not giving a definition of God. It's impossible to divine God in human terms. 
What he was trying to do was to direct our thoughts away from a finite form or from thinking of God as some kind of superman sitting in the skies, remote from us sitting in judgment, and to think of God as the very breath we breathe. So when we think of God as a person, he's always up there or out there somewhere. We are forever trying to find him then. And to reach him, to influence or appease him, we think we have to pray to something external to ourselves. Some years ago, when the first Russian cosmonaut orbited the Earth, he came back saying very confidently, and I quote, there is no God, for I didn't see him out there, unquote. So he didn't see God, my friends. But I'm pretty sure he didn't see gravity either. And if gravity didn't exist, he would still be, I think, <laughs> following an eternal inertial pattern into oblivion. So he may not have found God beyond the skies, but with every breath he drew and every thought he formed, he was expressing God. I can just imagine him, you know, being helped out of his space suit on his return to Earth and saying, well, there is no creator out there. Thank God I'm an atheist. Dr. Ernest Holmes, the founder of our great teaching, writes in his magnum opus, The Science of Mind, page 75, paragraph 3, I believe, and I quote, We say God is spirit, but no one ever saw God. The Bible says, No man hath seen God at any time, only the Son. He hath revealed him. To express this idea in our language, no one has seen cause because we see an effect. And because we see an effect, we know there must be a cause. Nothing is more evident than the fact that we live, and since we live, we must have life. And since we have life, there must be life with a capital L. The only proof we have of mind is that we think. The eternal principle is forever hidden. End of that quote from Ernest Holmes. It is forever hidden, the eternal principle, my friends. You don't have to look out there to find it and to find the life principle. As the 19th century British poet Alfred Lord Tennyson writes, and I quote, closer is he than breathing, nearer than hands and feet, unquote. This awesome presence is personalized in what Jesus referred to as the Father within me. The life principle at work in you and as you is the all-knowingness of God. It is the source of your creative power, and it seeks ever to express and fulfill itself in and through you. Early New Thought luminary Eric Butterworth writes in his book, Discover the Power Within You, and I quote, you can never be separated from God because you are an expression of God. The very self-givingness of God cannot forsake you any more than gravity can forsake you. As an expression of God, you are God expressing himself as you, and your greatest desire should be to let him have his way. Meister Eckhart had this feeling when he said that God expects only one thing of you, and that is that you should stop thinking of yourself as a created being and let God be God in you. End of that Butterworth quote. Let God be God in you and as you. This means that the true self of you, the spiritual being, which is who you really are, is the individualization of the God presence and God power. You are the presence of God at the point where you are in your existence right now. And when you come to that realization, you can say with Jesus the Master, I and the Father are one. 
Do you have the confidence to say that with me this morning, my friends? I and the Father are one. Can we say that? I and the Father are one. And I always add at the end, and the Father is the one. So let us say it together. I and the Father are one, and the Father is the one. Can we say that? I and the Father are one, and the Father is the one. And so, friends, at the, at the root of Jesus' concept of the God presence within us, which he called Father, was an awareness, a deep, deep awareness of oneness, of spiritual unity with the God presence and God power and with all of God's creation. St. Paul refers to this as God in whom we live and move and have our being. In other words, we live and have our being in the infinite ocean of intelligence and life and substance, which is God. And when we become aware of this, we can say that with all confidence that we have the universe at our disposal. And as it says in Luke uh, 15, verse 31, I quote, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that is mine is thine. What an assurance. Son, thou art ever with me, and all that is mine is thine. My friends, perhaps you are disturbed because you have been leaning on a God of the intellect. A God preached to you all of your life, but a God whose presence you have never really felt. If you are asleep to the activity of the presence in you, if like the prodigal son, you have wandered into a far country, you feel distant and remote and separated from God, you have come to the right place. Because here at the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living, we are teaching the omnipresence of God, that God is not something remote from you. And you will find a warm and non-judgmental welcome to this temple as you join us in worship and in study and in understanding more and more of your own divinity and that purpose for which you have come to this physical plane to express your spiritual magnificence. Join us in all of our activities and on Facebook Live and discover the truth of your oneness with the one so that you can say with the master, I and the father are one. You are created, my friends, in the image and likeness of God. And I know we say that all the time, but really, what does that really mean to us? And so this brings me to the assignment that Sandra promised you you were sure to get. And everyone knows that when I speak, I always give an assignment. And you know, the people who attend our Thursday morning in-person class, um, the new positive spirituality, they have a head start because we discussed this together in class last week. But they still have to do this assignment. Your mission, should you decide to undertake it, is to spend some quiet time today contemplating what it means to you to be created in the image and likeness of God. What does it mean to you? Does it mean, as Sandy uh, shared in her inspirational reading this morning, that it means taking good care of your body temple, taking care of yourself? Because, you know, if you don't take care of yourself and you are created in the image and likeness of God, it's a kind of a logical conclusion that you're, you are actually dissing God because you're not taking care of God's perfect creation. So just spend some time contemplating and maybe write in your journal or post it on the Facebook, on, our, on the Temple of Light Facebook page. To be created in the image and likeness of God means to me. And see if you can express that in a sentence or two. How is that image and likeness being expressed in your life? And maybe when you do that, you will, you will then begin to use that as your, your yardstick, your measure. 
all through this week and beyond. Whenever you are going to say something or do something, you think, is this congruent with being the image and likeness of God? Am I in integrity with that purpose that I have set for myself to be that which God intended me to be as I let God be God in my life and my affairs? There's a lovely little story of a little boy who is tired of uh, doing online Sunday school and decides that he's going to go, go out in, uh, into the world, he's going to go for a walk and find God for himself. He knows it might take him a little time, so he decides to pack some you know, provisions. So he puts some cookies and a box of juice in his backpack and he sets off. But he doesn't get very far before he feels a bit tired and he, he decides to stop and have a snack and take a rest. And so he sits on a park bench uh, next to an elderly gentleman with the kindest eyes he has ever seen. So he sits down and he takes out his cookie and the old gentleman's eyes are, are sparkling with the most beautiful smile. And so he offers him a cookie and he takes the proffered cookie and he begins to eat it. Not a word is spoken between them. Every now and then the little boy steals a look at him and there is that smile and those sparkling eyes. And so they have another cookie and another cookie. And then, of course, we have to have some juice. So he shares his juice with the old gentleman. And then he says, oh, it's getting dark. I, need, I better get home. And so the little boy gets up to leave. And the old gentleman, still silent, gets up to leave too. And the little boy walks off saying, bye. And then he turns for one last look at that beautiful smile and those bright eyes. And he's overcome with joy. And he runs back and he, he gives the old gentleman a real big hug. And so when he walks into his, his house, his mother says, where were you? I was getting a bit worried. It's getting dark. And he said, you needn't have worried, Mom. I, I was quite safe. I had lunch with God. Meanwhile, across town, the old gentleman enters a, a small apartment. He lets himself in, and his wife greets him, wiping her hands on the kitchen towel. And she says, Horace, I was just getting worried about you, you know. It was getting dark, and what with your inability to speak since the stroke last year, I thought, how could you even ask for help if you needed it? Horace spoke for the first time in 15 months. Quote, you needn't have worried, Gwen. I had lunch with God. And I was really surprised on how young he is. End of that story. And so my friends, today as you sit down to your Sunday dinner, I want you to know that you are having lunch with God. If you are on your own, living by yourself, you are having lunch with God. And if you are with family or friends, give thanks because you are having lunch with God. And the little boy's big learning from that encounter, which he shared with his mom later, was that God doesn't have to speak to tell you how much he loves you. It is, it is conveyed at a deeper level, at a level where of feeling, a level of the heart, which goes beyond words to a deep knowing that you are in the presence and the presence is in you. So when you bless your meal today, do so in the knowledge that you are dining with God. Share your lunch with God, for you are the activity of God in perfect manifestation. Nothing can separate you from this perfect and perfecting presence and power. It is right where you are. This is the wonderful truth that Jesus came to teach, and this is the Christ in you your hope of glory. You are created in the image and likeness of something so beautiful, so awesome, so powerful, so pure, so whole and holy and wholesome, 
that you can only give thanks that it is part of you as you are part of it. Believe it, my friends. Live it to the honor and glory of God. God loves you and so do I. Namaste.